morning. Uh, howdy. My name is Zhefan, a master's student in Dr. Shea's lab. It's my honor to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Vidu Gart. After graduating from the Pennsylvania State University, he, he, he has been studying at Sydney Cable Medical College for his master's degree. After that, he has studied at the National Children's Hospital in Ohio and then the in UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. And now he's a professor in Department of Pediatric and Department of, of Molecular Genetics in Ohio State University, and also the director and the pediatric cardiologist in Nationwide Children's Hospital. Well, uh, during these years, he has published lots of articles in peer reviewed journals and received many honors and awards. He has also been invited to give them speaker, uh, to give lectures in many symposiums and conferences. Mm, Dr. Vidu's research is mainly about the mechanism of uh, congenital heart disease, which is the most common type of birth defect. Until now, he has discovered the effect of some genes relevant with the heart development, like GATA4 and TBX5 and how they cause the defect in heart development. Today, he is here to give us a wonderful lecture, and the title is Insights into the Etiology of Congenital Heart Disease from Human Genetics to, to Mouse Model. Let's welcome Dr. Vidu Gart. Thank you. Um, thank you for the nice introduction, and thank you, Ling Lin, for um, inviting me. Um, it's a real pleasure to um, be here and, and visit um, everyone that I met with this morning. It's fun talking science. And um, what I'm going to try to do today is give a little bit of an overview of, of congenital heart disease and the genetics of congenital heart disease. And then I'll spend probably the last um, 20 minutes of my talk talking about a new project that's some unpublished data looking at maternal diabetes and its influence on congenital heart disease. So as we just heard, um, congenital heart disease is the most common type of birth defect. Um, it affects about one out of every 100 live births. And so just for orientation, this is a normal heart. So the blue blood comes back to the right side of the heart, gets pumped out to the lungs where it gets oxygen, and comes back to the left side of the heart and goes to this pumping chamber and gets pumped out to the body. And when I say congenital heart disease, it can be highly variable. It can be anything from holes in the heart here between the walls is separating the upper chambers or the lower chambers, or it can be something more severe where a whole chamber doesn't form properly and remains quite small. Um, one other defect that we don't even really consider is one of the congenital heart defects. Normally this aortic valve, which would sit right here for the, um, above in the aorta, normally has three leaflets. Sometimes two of them get fused and it's called a bicuspid aortic valve, and that's found in one out of every hundred um, individuals. And so it's actually quite common and it can cause quite a, a, a bit of disease. There's been lots of improvements over the past five, six decades in terms of our surgical management of these patients and so they're continuing to, to do better as they um, in becoming adults. But the etiology for the majority of these cases is unknown and really when you simply think about it, what is a congenital heart defect? It's when this process of normal heart development doesn't occur normally. And so around two weeks gestation, the, the cells that are going to become the, the cardiomyocytes and the cardiac progenitors are formed in the shape of this cardiac crescent. They'll fuse in the midline to form this linear heart tube that beats around three weeks of gestation. It'll undergo rightward looping. And then by about eight, eight to ten weeks of um, gestation, you're going to have a normal, you know, almost fully uh, mature heart that still needs to undergo a lot of growth and some valve valvular remodeling, but you already have your four chambers, you have the walls that are dividing the two chambers. Um, very, so it occurs very early in development. And this process has been studied in multiple um, model systems, including mouse, zebrafish, fruit flies, and essentially a lot of the molecular pathways during this process have been mapped out. And that has essentially also led to when we can now do a lot of um, knockouts in these different mo model systems, or now with gene editing, you can now show that as you remove these genes, that you can have disruption of these different processes during heart development. And that coincides with what we know from human studies. And this is a slide that's now nearly almost 50 years old, but it's still quite accurate when we think about what we think is the etiology of congenital heart disease. 
It was uh, proposed by James Nora, and the way it's kind of put together that there's genetic factors and there's environmental factors. And the font size here is kind of how important it is in terms of prevalence within the population. So you can have chromosomal abnormalities or mutations in single genes that can cause um, congenital heart disease, and they actually are causing it with a pretty strong influence, with little interaction from environment. Well, the majority is multifactorial, where there's multiple genetic factors and probably environmental factors that ultimately cause disease. This co concept of genetic factors was borne out by a lot of epidemiology studies that were done in congenital heart disease, where essentially if you had an affected family member, a sibling or a parent, that was the greatest risk factor. So we see that there's an increased recurrence risk within families if you have congenital heart disease. And so clearly genetic evaluation has become important in our, in our patient populations that we see who have congenital heart disease. It started with very sim early um, technologies in terms of just doing karyotyping and looking at all the chromosomes. Clearly that is useful to some extent, um, but there's limits of detection. There's uh, something called fluorescent in situ hybridization where you can actually use a molecular probe and look for a certain region to see if it's um, present or absent within the chromosomal regions. But again, you have to know where you're looking for it. It's not really applicable to a genome-wide level. But that did lead to advances in our understanding. So we know there's genetic syndromes essentially related to chromosomal aneuploidy, where there's either extra chromosomes or missing pieces of some chromosomes that are associated with a lot of congenital heart defects. But over the past 10 to 15 years, there's been lots of advances in our um, genetic technologies, especially in light of sequencing of the human genome in about now 15 years ago. That really allowed us to really move forward in terms of genetic linkage analysis and positional cloning. There's um, techniques where you can do chromosomal microarray where you can actually look for small areas that are either deleted or duplicated within the human genome. And then there's direct sequencing of candidate genes, either by Sanger, some of these genes that have been implicated in animal model systems, or now more recently whole exome and whole genome sequencing. And that really allowed us to gain some more insight into some of these genetic causes, be it for the cause of Marfan syndrome or the gene that we was just mentioned, TBX5, is the cause of Holtorum syndrome. So you're beginning to see now that we have more chromosomal abnormalities, if you think of trisomy 21, single gene mutations, primarily in syndromic disease, and this is just a subset that are shown here, that are really becoming increasingly recognized that we know that's the cause of the congenital heart disease that we see. While this has been um, impressive advancements in terms of where we've been over the past 10, 15 years, the majority of cases that we see of congenital heart disease are not those that are associated with syndromes. It are those that are associated with that's the only defect that we see in terms of these children. And so this is just two large studies that were looking at um, congenital heart disease and this portion here in pink is isolated congenital heart disease one in um, kind of purplish colors are either chromosomal or syndrome, which means that there's additional birth defects that are occurring. And so two-thirds to three-quarters are, are non-syndromic. And that really has been the focus of my research. Um, as a pediatric cardiologist, that's what I see majority of the time, is these non-syndromic cases. And the questions that parents often want to know is, why did this congenital heart defect occur? Um, and so when I initially started at um, UT Southwestern, um, in my training and as a junior faculty member, I was lucky enough to come across this large family and every person who's shaded in either red or black is an affected individual. And so this family spans five generations. There's 17 people who are affected and uh, primarily they had holes between the upper chambers or the lower chambers of the heart. And so when you get large families like these, you can go ahead and move to positional cloning approaches and actually try to figure out which part of the genome is linked to the disease. And so we are able to identify a region on chromosome 8 um, in which re in that region there li lies an important cardiac transcription factor, GATA4, which I think m many of you may have heard about from Ling Lin's work. Um, and from there, we are able to actually identify the mutation that was causing the disease within this family. And since then, other individuals have looked um, at patients who have um, isolated septal defects and had found different mutations in GATA4 that have been linked to disease. But clearly, that's not the only thing that we want to do. We want to try to understand disease mechanisms and try to understand how can a mutation in a single gene cause disease. 
And so that's when you can go back to those animal models that we had developed um, in the past. We were just knocking out genes, and we've actually been able to knock in this mutation into a mouse. And by re um, inserting this mutation within the, the mouse genome, we, can, we were able to show that it, it had some functions, but not all the functions of, of GATA4. So it was a hypomorphic mutation. And what was most interesting is that we were able to generate a mouse model that kind of recapitulated the disease that we saw in our human patients. And so this is just an, an ultrasound of the heart. And you can see that there's, instead of having a wall where there's no communication, you can see there's communications between the upper chambers of the heart, similar to what we saw in our family members. And the other phenotype, which I didn't talk about within our families, they actually had a subset of them had valve stenosis of the outflow tracts. And we were able to also see that. And so this is just an echocardiogram. This is the left ventricle. This is the aorta. Normally, you see nice laminar flow, this nice red, or if it's going in a different direction, nice blue to the pulmonary artery. There's an increased velocity that goes along with narrowing that's um, quantified here in a subset of our, our, our mice. And so we're actually now using this as a model to actually study the development of valve, heart valve disease. In a, in a similar manner, um, we were able to uncover a family that had um, bicuspidic valve. That was a, the defect that I said that's present in 1% of the population. Again, very similar type of approach, large family. They had bicuspidic valve. It doesn't really cause a lot of problems um, as children, but usually what happens during adulthood, you can get calcification of these valve leaflets, often requiring valve replacement, or you can get aneurysmal dilation above that valve, right, that sits right here, that can ultimately needs to either to be surgically intervened upon or um, can actually tear and can actually cause lethality. Similar approaches were applied um, with this family, able to identify a single gene called NOTCH1, um, where we were able to show that it was essentially mutations in the genes that would truncate this receptor um, that would ultimately were associated with disease. And again, I just want to kind of give an overview of what my lab has been doing is we've been then we're kind of lucky in terms of studying some of our um, roles of notch one and valve calcification. We were able to cross this notch one mouse that only has one copy of notch one into a, a background where there's no endothelial nitric oxide synthase. And essentially, you can see it very clean, clearly here that this is a bicuspidic valve. And it's essentially, again, creating a, a model system within the mouse of a, a very complex disease process that we see in humans. So this is just normal three leaflet aortic valves that we see in wild type mice. The notch heterozygous mice were essentially normal also. The NOS3 mice, interestingly enough, not that well understood, um, also have a bicuspidic valve in about 25% a, a of them. And but then in these compound mutants, so the ones that survived, I should say, about a third of them will survive, will develop almost 100% of them will have this bicuspidic valve phenotype. And they not only have that, they also develop stenosis. So this is similar to what I showed you before. They, this is nice normal flow from the left ventricle to the aorta. And here you're seeing this increased velocity. And again, now we have a model that we can now study in the mouse of congenital heart disease that develops disease with time. As I mentioned, um, these um, individuals in our family, they not only had the valve calcification and the bicuspidic valve, they also had um, aneurysms of the aorta. And so this is just kind of a depiction of what we're looking at right here. Um, this is the left ventricle would sit here. This is the aortic valve right here. This is kind of the sinuses of the aorta. And this is the ascending aorta that's going to ultimately go down and supply blood to the whole body. And Normally, you're going to have this left ventricle and this normal kind of widening and then narrowing. And you can see here in our um, mice that what we ended up doing to try to understand if notch one played a role in this aneurysm formation, we actually looked for a genetic interaction with another mouse that's known to have um, dilation, the, the Marfan syndrome mouse. And what we can show is that this notch one mutation essentially functioned as a genetic modifier. So with just the wild type, you have a normal aorta. With these compound mutants, again, with notch one and fibrillin being mutated, you had a very large aorta, especially in that aneurysmal region. And these are just the different phenotypes, these compound mutants. Here's the fibrillin mouse, the notch one, and the wild type. The notch one and wild type, over time, this is the 
this measurement right here at the sinuses are normal. The fibrillin mouse has a mild aortic root dilation, and these compound mutants had a much more significant dilation. Again, showing a role for notch one in aortic aneurysm development, which hadn't been shown before. We were able to then cross this into a different strain, so it was a pure 129 um, background strain, and essentially we were able to show just with notch one, one copy of it, you can see aortic root dilation. Again, a mild phenotype within our mice, but again, creating this idea that you can then use the human genetic findings and create mouse models um, that we can then study the development of a disease. Similar to that, um, I mentioned when these compound mutants, they were um, very highly lethal. About a, a th two thirds of them would die embryonically right after birth. And so we went back at earlier time points to try to understand why these um, embryos were dying. And so these are just histologic sections to these compound mutants. This is right ventricle, left ventricle, and this is the aorta, the aortic valve. We found, as not surprisingly, that the um, aortic valves were really thick. But the other interesting thing that we saw was the pulmonary valves were also really thick in some of our um, embryos, and we also saw these ventricular septal defects. And so there's some other um, interesting disease that, that um, was surprising to us, because within our family, we mainly saw left-sided disease, disease affecting either the left ventricle, the mitral valve, or the aortic valve, like the bicuspidic valve that I talked about. And that is thought to be a little bit more genetic, if you want to think of it. The recurrence risk is as high as 10 percent. And so we were surprised to see disease affecting the right side of the heart. We went back and kind of looked at our family, and we did see one individual who had tetralogy of Fallot. And what tetralogy of Fallot is, it's, it's a pheno, it's a a cardiac malformation that essentially involves narrowing of the right side of the heart, so this pulmonary valve, uh, right ventricular alpha tract obstruction, or pulmonary valve stenosis, and also these VSDs. And so we were surprised by that, um, but then there's been additional reports where people were finding mutations in notch one with disease that also affected the right side of the heart. Here um, from this group in Australia where there's um, individuals who had a mutation in notch one that had tetralogy of flow, and then this individual um, right here who had a bicuspid pulmonary valve who had two mutations in notch one. And so this has actually kind of allowed us to try to think of genotype phenotype correlations which actually may be relevant as we move forward in terms of human studies. This is a large study out of um, the Netherlands by the Wessels group where they screened 428 individuals who had um, left sided congenital heart disease. And essentially what they were able to find was they found 14 out of 428, so about 3 to 4 percent of them will have mutations in notch one. But I think the interesting thing was it was primarily in the ones that had other family members who were affected, which makes sense in terms of this is going to be something that's going to be passed down um, among generations that's contributing. But of those nine cases, nine of them, there's also somebody else who had disease on the right side of the heart. And so as I mentioned, with the GATA4 mutation, people have screened other families with ASDs, atrial septal defects, and they found a lot of mutations. Most of the time when people were screening for notch one, this is now 10 years ago, and I would meet investigators, and they'd be like, we've been looking for notch one mutations and we don't find any. Because um, bicuspidic valve is relatively common, you didn't really see a lot of um, mutations. It seems like there, there's some sort of a combination here that it's the families that have disease that affects both the right and left side of the heart, that's where you're going to find these mutations in notch one. And actually, if you go back to the original family, we didn't report it that way or think of it that way, but that's what we had in our original family too. And I think that's where we're going to see the mutations. And I think our mouse models are now recapitulating that exact same phenotype where we're seeing disease on both the right and the left side of the heart. So this is not just my work, but um, a lot of uh, individuals work where we've now been able to identify an increasing number of um, genes that are in important, um, that are single gene mutations that are contributing to disease. They have different levels of um, support in terms of causing disease. I think some are um, better shown than others, but there's an increasing number of um, genes that are contributing to non-syndromic congenital heart disease. So one of the things that we've moved on to um, um, recently is whole exome and whole genome sequencing. The idea being there that we're now having an increasing number of um, genes that have been implicated in congenital heart disease. Can we use these approaches to discover novel genes? And as 
everyone here is likely aware the cost of whole exome and whole genome sequencing is continually going down. Uh, this is almost out of date now. Um, I think we can, I, we recently recruited some new um, genomic scientists and they're, we can do a whole exome for $250 now and the whole genome is getting into, you know, getting closer and closer to being under $1,000. So how fast can we, um, it, the limitation is no longer um, the cost. It's really, you know, can we find the families and can we find the individuals that we want to sequence? And so we did a, a, a small project. Um, this was a collaboration with Kim McBride, who's a geneticist at my institution, and Peter White, who runs the Biomedical Genomics Corps. We took some families that it appeared that it's genetic um, in terms of the disease. They could be septal defects. Um, they could be uh, patent ductus arteriosus, which is a, a fetal embryonic vessel that normally closes right after birth, um, or they could be that tetralogy of Fallot phenotype or pulmonary valve stenosis. So we went ahead and uh, took this tech whole exome sequencing within these families. Um, a lot of this, you know, is just a, a high-end um, sequencing using uh, the Illumina platform. Um, Peter White's group here at, at Nationwide Children's Hospital had their own pipeline in terms of sequence alignment and um, variant calling. I think when we did this, uh, we were initially very excited in terms of we're going to get the answer right away because these are families and we should be able to see it. One of the hypotheses I actually had was if I had had this technology 10 years ago and I had given one sample of the GATA4 family, it would be obvious that I would just have seen it within one, you know, in, in minutes. Um, reality was this. You get lots of data. You get lots of variants. Um, this is just a, a, it's an example in terms of just you can use a variety of different um, filtering a algorithms to try to reduce the number of variants, but you're still left with a lot of variants. About 250,000, you can start saying, well, congenital heart disease is rare, so it, it needs to be a variant that's less than 1% of the population. That will reduce it. You can start saying it needs to be um, in the protein coding regions because we don't really understand the non-coding genome. You'll get even further. It needs to alter. It needs to change the amino acid. So that will get to you. It needs to be predicted to be damaging. You're still left with a lot when you start looking at each, each of these individuals. And I'll show you some examples of how it even, we're still struggling with that in some of our families. And so we, we went backwards and we said, why are we, let's take an approach of we know some of the genes that are implicated and let's start working that way and working forward. With the idea being that we have nine families, some of these have to be much easier to be able to figure out. So we put together, um, a, a student in my lab put together a list of genes that are um, a candidate gene list, that genes that are, are known to cause congenital heart disease. In terms of there has to be a published report of at least three sporadic cases, so uh, with a similar phenotype. So you can't have one mutation in bicuspidotic valve and one in atrial septal defect and one in tetralogy of flow. They had to be in the same thing so that there's some concordancy in terms of where these mutations are being identified. Or there was a family where you had multiple family members and you were able to see segregation with the idea being that these are stronger candidate genes. And she came up with a list of about 69 genes. We went back to our data sets that we had from whole exome. We again then said you need it to be rare. It has to be a rare um, amino, uh, sequence variant. And then looked for segregation within the family and predicted um, pathogenic pathogenicity. And so within four of the families we had a um, a handful of variants. Now it's much smaller because the number of genes is much smaller. We went from 25,000 to 69. Um, so we were able to quickly identify um, some very interesting candidate genes. And three of them, we used a, a criteria that's actually been used clinically, the American College of Medical Genetics criteria, in terms of saying, is this, thing path is this variant pathogenic? And there were three genes, uh, three families we found likely pathogenic genes, GATA4 in an atrial septal defect family, uh, toloid like one in another atrial septal defect family, and myosin he ch heavy chain 11 in a patent ductus arteriosus family. And so I just want to briefly just kind of show you the three families and just kind of some of the limitations. And so when I showed you those original families with GATA4 and NOTCH1, that was when I was young. I was a junior faculty member, and we were, I was driving all over Texas and Dallas to try to get patient families. And so I had almost everyone in that family. Reality is, you're now more, I'm a more senior investigator, and so in this family, even though there was multiple people who were affected, we only had two 
individuals, these two that were affected with atrial septal defects. And this um, family, again, multiple people who were affected. We only had one affected and one unaffected. And this myosin heavy chain 11, we did a little bit better. We had the child, um, grandparents, and then some um, great aunts and, um, yeah, great aunts that were available. So we didn't get everyone. But we are still able to use this approach. And um, I think I can show you that this is actually quite useful and could potentially be used clinically. Um, within the GATA4 family, this is a variant that this um, glycine to tryptophan that had never been reported for. Clearly is causal based off of the multiple other publications that have linked mutations in GATA4 with um, atrial septal defects. The taller like one, I would actually say, has the least bit of evidence. I think Ling Lin has some interesting um, data um, that this may be a gene that's um, regulated by TBX5, which causes um, Holtorum syndrome, which is characterized by atrial septal defects. But there's three other patients who have mutations with essentially in the same region as this one that is also linked to atrial septal defects. So we feel pretty confident that this is likely causal. The myosin heavy chain 11 mutation was actually the most interesting mutation. It's a splice site mutation. And you can see it's in this um, child here. And this child was actually born premature. And so prematurity is a known non-genetic cause of patent ductus arteriosus. And then this grandmother, or great aunt here, was born to a mom, or born to a mom who had maternal rubella. And maternal rubella is, again, a non-environmental cause that's known to cause um, patent ductus arteriosus. And so with our whole um, exome sequencing, we can see that this child here has the mutation, and um, it, the mutation is what's causing the patent ductus arteriosus, not the prematurity. While here in this um, great aunt, what we're seeing is that it's the maternal rubella, an environmental cause, because she doesn't carry the mutation. So it's actually kind of an interesting um, exercise in terms of when you're looking at a family, you clearly see that it's genetic. You can't always rely on the fact that it's autosomal dominant. There may be individuals, if you had actually done linkage analysis within this family, we would never have gotten to this locus. And this, this gene has been linked to patent ductus arteriosus in, in large families, and also linked to aortic aneurysms. And so We've actually changed the care of our patients in terms of following these patients for the development of aortic aneurysms. And so essentially where we are in terms of this exome sequencing, it's clearly um, useful. We actually think it, we are moving toward whole exome sequencing in our clinical setting. And I think for familial cases, especially where they have the same type of phenotypes, so you're looking at ASDs or PDA, everybody has the same thing. Um, it can be very valuable to try to identify the gene. But we are also doing some stuff with purely left-sided disease, which has been shown to have a lot, there's a lot more families available. I would argue that it's not as clean. We're finding lots of variants, and most likely it's going to be something called oligogenic. And again, if you go back to the initial slide, when you look at multifactorial, it's actually under genetic factors, that there's likely multiple genetic factors that are contributing to it. And so these are just a couple families that, in some of the data that we found. And so this is the family that had pulmonary valve stenosis. There was three people who were affected. And as you can see, we can find variants. This TCF7L1 is an important member of the wind signaling pathway. This is a very rare variant. Um, if you look at the, the um, large databases, um, this is SMID1, which is a, a, an epigenetic regulator that when you knock it out, you don't develop, the heart doesn't develop properly. Again, very rare. You can see that these are found in the affected individuals and not in the unaffected. One comes from one parent, one comes from another parent. The idea of there being is that once they are, occur in the same child, you get the disease. Linking these, linking pathways is, um, I think, one of the harder things that we're trying to do in the field. And this is just an example, again, family with tetralogy of flow. Here's triplets. All three of them have tetralogy of flow. You would think that it's going to be genetic. It's going to be relatively easy. But BMP10, PAX3, Krells1, Titan, all of these genes are important in terms of heart cardiac development. And these are all rare variants. And you can see that all of them share that. And some of the variants are coming from mom, and some of the variants are coming from dad. And we can, we can, I can go through the other families and show you similar data that you now have to try to figure out, is it just these two, or is it a combination of all three? And how do you ultimately show that there's gene-gene interaction? So we're actually, 
working with um, Zihan at Children's National. The idea being there, can we test some of this in, in the fly model for gene-gene interactions much faster than you would in a mouse model? Um, and then if we see gene-gene interactions, then we'll go to the mouse model to try to show that these um, interact. And I think ultimately you can move to gene editing and actually create these mutations, but to do that um, initially is just very costly and a lot of work um, and not knowing exactly what you may find. And so that's kind of where I think the field is, I would say, in terms of whole um, exome and whole genome sequencing is it's probably going to be oligogenic for a significant number of cases, um, and, but to demonstrate that and, and prove that mechanistically I think will be a, is going to be a challenge right now and you need almost high throughput ways to, to, to determine what these rare frequency variants that are predicted to be damaging by bioinformatic algorithms, are they actually contributing to disease. So going back to that um, original slide, um, one of the, you know, the other thing that's kind of sitting over here on, 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 the, on our right side of the slide is environment. And that's really kind of not really been that well studied, I would say, within um, our field. We've seen so many advancements in, in our, you know, in, um, analyzing the genome, we focused on these genetic factors. And I think we've made a lot of headway in terms of trying to understand the genetic contributors to congenital heart disease. But it's clearly not explaining everything. And so we started, embarked on a project looking at gene environment interaction. And we kind of went at the, the one that's probably the best well described in terms of being a risk factor, and that's maternal diabetes. And this is a paper from 1973 by um, Alexander Natus, who is a senior cardiologist at Boston Children's. And essentially what he's showing here is that there's an increased risk. Um, they looked at 470 infants of diabetic mothers, and they had a 4% incidence of congenital heart disease, so five times greater than the 0.8 to 1% that's normally seen. And again, in the paper, he refers back to um, the James Nora hypothesis that there's multifactorial etiologies to disease and that there's gene environment interactions. Um, and I think here, you know, congenital heart diseases are not all one disease. There's a hereditary predisposition determined by many genes and an environmental trigger acts on the predisposed individual. And I think that's where at least my thought process as we're moving forward in terms of these rare variants that we see with our whole exome sequencing, this is likely what we're going to see. Now, how do you connect um, environmental triggers to genetic predisposition is, I think, is a challenge. Um, so we move forward um, with maternal diabetes, as I mentioned, it increases the risk anywhere from three to six fold. Um, at some interesting work um, looking at human patient, uh, human, uh, humans where moms, where they were actually able to kind of they predicted that there's a direct correlation between maternal glucose as a continuous variable for the risk. So the idea being the higher it is, the higher glucose level, the higher the, higher the chance of having congenital heart, heart disease. It's one study, but I think it's kind of an interesting idea. Especially as a cardiologist, we, we can say the same thing for LDL cholesterol. You know, it increases the risk and then there's a direct correlation. When you see the, when you see the um, maternal diabetes, they have a spectrum of um, cardiac malformations. They can be um, laterality or looping defects. Instead of looping to the right, there can be abnormalities there. Conotruncal anomalies is essentially it's the outflow tract, so the pulmonary artery, the aorta, or septation defects, so the atrial septal defects or ventricular septal defects. The molecular mechanisms are essentially unknown, but it, um, as many of you know, it's, it's thought to be predicted to be epigenetic. And epigenetics, um, I think I, I spoke to like Nancy here about DNA methylation as one um, um, area, histone, um, post-translational modifications, and then even microRNAs or long non-coding RNAs as, as potential um, methods to, re uh, as mechanisms for how hyperglycemia is leading to um, congenital heart disease. So we recently did some work um, try to address this um, from a purely um, epigenetic standpoint. Um, so we'd, we've done some ATAC-seq, um, which is a, a recently described method to look at open and closed um, chromatin areas, use this um, hyperactive TN5 transposase, which is a, essentially is able to integrate and then um, fragment areas that are of open chromatin, and then they also tag it which allows you to then move to our next generation sequencing approaches and really amplify those regions that are in open areas. And so um, 
one of my postdoctoral fellows, Madhubita, Ma Madhubita Basu, um, did this in just um, an embryonic a cardiac cell line, so atrioventricular mes mesenchymal cells that are made by Kai Zhao, who provided them to us. And so she basically cultured these um, cells in normal glycemic conditions and hyperglycemic conditions. And essentially here you're looking at the signal enrichment for um, normal glycemia and hyperglycemia, and we're just doing a comparison. And you can essentially see that there's more areas that are um, not as open um, in the hyperglycemic conditions. And essentially they're near the um, transcriptional start site, um, primarily upstream and overlapping that. And so when we, we are, we've analyzed this data, and I just want to focus on one thing that we saw that was quite interesting, specifically at the NOS3 locus, so this is endothelial nitric oxide synthase, you can see that the peaks here are the open areas um, uh, where um, there's open chromatin, which is likely where there's um, enhancer regions. Within our hypoglycemic conditions, especially in R1 and R3, there's almost complete loss of that, implying that they're closed. We've um, done some H3, um, K27 acetylation marks, and it's essentially seeing the same thing when we do the pull downs within our cells, that there's um, decrease of acetylation at all of these three peaks. We've looked at NOS3 mRNA within these cells. Um, in hyperglycemia, you see less transcription. We've actually done um, NOS3 antibody. So this is the, the enzyme, the synthase that uh, makes NO. And then we also see decreased expression um, of NOS3. And so this was interesting to us, if you actually go back to um, what I presented a little bit earlier. Um, so nitric oxide um, is, a, is an important pathway. It's important for numerous um, pa um, processes during development and during uh, adulthood, especially in the cardiovascular system. NO is made by three synthases. There's endothelial NOS, neuronal NOS, and inducible NOS. And I think one of the interesting things that I briefly mentioned that when you delete ENOS or NOS3 in, in mice, you get a, a spectrum of cardiac malformations. And it's never really been explained why. You know, what is endothelial or NOS3 doing during development to ultimately cause uh, congenital heart defects? Um, Hyperglycemia is well known in the um, adult cardiovascular field to, to result in increased production of reactive oxygen species that ultimately leads to reduced NO bioavailability. And so as I mentioned before, we had already kind of linked nitric oxide signaling and NOS3, uh, NOTCH signaling by a genetic interaction. Um, and so as I mentioned, mutations in NOTCH1 cause human disease. And we were able to recapitulate that when we had compound mutants, where you had one copy of NOTCH1 and no um, NOS3. And you saw a spectrum of things from conotruncal disease to semilunar valve disease. And just to briefly tell you about the NOTCH1 signaling pathway, it's an intracellular pathway, um, membrane-bound um, membrane -bound receptors. And essentially, this is the NOTCH1 receptor. It interacts with two families of ligands, the jagged and the delta-like family of ligands. Once you have, um, and they're both membrane-bound, so it's cell-cell interaction. Once you have um, binding of the receptor, there's a series of cleavages that allows the NOTCH1 intracellulomane to translate, translocate to the nucleus, where it essentially functions as a transcription factor. And so, this provided a lot of evidence to start looking at a potential interaction between hyperglycemia and NOTCH signaling, with the idea there that hyperglycemia is reducing NO nitric oxide into theonitric oxide by an, an epigenetic mechanism, and then we've already had previously demonstrated that NO and NOTCH seem to have an interaction. So we wanted to see, is there an interaction between hyperglycemia and NOTCH signaling? And so we used the, the AVM cells that I mentioned before, cultured in both um, high and low normal and high glucose conditions, and then we used a mouse model, which is more of a type 1 type diabetes mouse model, where we um, introduced streptodesocin um, intraperitoneally that's um, toxic to the um, islet cells uh, that make in insulin, and we, we kept them a mildly hyperglycemic. You can make them higher and get more severe defects, but we we're probably more between the 2 to 300 um, range in terms of our hyperglycemia. So as one would expect um, within our, um, when we exposed, um, looked at the cells and or embryos that were exposed to um, high glucose, we saw an increase in, in ROS as shown here, and this is in the cells, and this is within the um, embryonic heart at E13.5 with increased ROS as measured by DHE staining. And, 
correlate with that when we see the increase in ROS, we also saw a decrease in nitric oxide signaling. Interesting that NO seemed to be dropping off much more around the um, AB cushions and the, and the valve leaflets um, as opposed to the myocardium. I'm not sure exactly if there's other uh, mechanisms for um, NO production that are leading to some of that um, differences in expression there. So we also went to see, you know, does hyperglycemia affect notch signaling? So again, using our um, cell-based system, we looked at notch and some of its downstream targets are HAY1 and HAY2, efferins and norregulin-1. And at, at, from an mRNA level, we saw a, a decrease um, with hyperglycemia. We also see um, notch one intracellular domain, as I mentioned, is the active form. You see with hyperglycemia, you see at 48 hours, there's a decreased expression of an ICD, also decreased expression of HAY2, and this is just the quantification there. Um, similarly, when we looked within the mouse heart, so this is the mouse embryonic heart that's been exposed to maternal diabetes, we see a similar decreased expression, and this is by um, protein expression looking specifically at NICD, you again see um, down, uh, decreased expression within the heart um, in the diabetic embryos. We then, then actually tested the gene-environment interaction. And so we specifically wanted to um, see if, if diabetes and uh, maternal diabetes and NOTCH1 haploinsufficiency, there was a gene-environment interaction. So it's a little bit of a complicated slide. So you're looking here at wild-type um, embryos that were exposed to a non or normal glucose environment or wild-type embryos exposed to a high glucose environment. And so you can see here Wild-type embryos exposed to a non-glucose environment, there was no um, congenital heart defects, specifically ventricular septal defects that we saw. When, you, when you're there exposed to a diabetic environment, there was about a 20% incidence, and this has been reported before. There's um, animal models of uh, maternal diabetes, and the VSDs that we essentially saw are kind of shown right here. When we then had a combination, so now we're mating a notch one heterozygous mouse to a wild-type mouse. Um, We've done it both ways, either the mom is notch one heterozygous or the, the wild type is um, notch one, the, the wild type is the mom. And in both cases, essentially, when you have a notch one head embryo that's exposed to a normal glucose, a very low incidence, we saw one out of 16 that had a VSD, but when you had a combination of the embryo being having only one copy of notch one exposed to maternal diabetes, almost all of them had these VSDs that we saw. And we really didn't see any change. Again, this is more of a mild hyperglycemic environment, maternal hyperglycemic environment. We, at 13.5, we really didn't see any change in terms of growth de or development of the embryo. Again, implying that we now have a gene environment interaction where you're getting congenital heart disease by having a, a combination of both loss of a, uh, of a gene and then also hyperglycemia. And so this was our model, elevated uh, maternal glucose. You see increased ROS, decreased NO. The, the UCUS NO is probably also related from a transcriptional level. And then you saw a decrease of signaling between in the, of the notch pathway to ultimately lead to these VSDs. And so we then were attempting to connect these two pathways. And so NO has also been proposed to be an epigenetic regulator of gene expression, specifically by interacting with this Jumanji C domaining uh, containing demethylases. And that was very interesting to us because one of these um, Jumanji C domaining um, demethylases has been shown to regulate notch 1, specifically Jared 2 contains a DNA binding in the Jumanji C domain. And when you delete this um, globally or endothelially, you get VSDs and you also get a, a, a non-compaction phenotype with increased expression of notch one. Essentially what happens is with Jared 2 um, will interact with SETDB1, which is an H3K9 methyltransferase, to repress expression of notch one. And that's essentially, it's been shown by Young Sook's Lee's lab at um, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, to show this pathway in terms of how Jared 2 and Notch are, are or Jared 2 is regulating Notch through um, SETDB1. So we asked those specific questions in our in our systems. Do we see um, upregulation of Jared 2? And and so both within our cells and in in our mouse hearts, you can see here at 48 hours, this is Jared 2 mRNA expression by um, RT-PCR. You can see upregulation. You can see upregulation at the protein level. And this is just quantification of that. And again, this is in our mouse hearts. mRNA is up. And then you can also see increased expression. Again, more in the cushion area um, that we see that. Um, 
we then tested the uh, importance of JR2, and so this is just knocking down JR2 within our in our cell line, our AVM cell lines. And again, the the main points here are that normally, when you look at Notch one expression, you go to from normal glucose to high glucose. This is with a control. You see Notch one to go down. Once you add the JR2 siRNA, you see that expression of Notch one is back up, and that's shown here again. Same idea. Um, JR2 goes up with hyperglycemia, once you have siRNA, you see that JR2 goes back down and notch one expression comes back up, especially notch one intracellular domain. And we wanted to see the role of NO donor in this process. Again, going back to our cell line, essentially we were able to show once you add the NO donor um, in the hyperglycemic conditions, you're able to knock down that expression of JR2 and rescue um, expression of the notch one intracellular domain. So, as I mentioned, um, it's not just that JR2 expression goes up, it needs to actually be bound at the notch one locus to actually reduce expression of notch one. So we um, went ahead and did some chromatin immunoprecipitation um, and PCR amplifying, specifically this notch one locus, which um, Dr. Lee had shown where um, not, uh, where JR2 and set db one bind, it's a plus 150. And so what she was able to do is she went ahead and pulled down with um, JR2 and amplified this region. And you can see once you're in hyperglycemia, there's not just more JR2, it's actually bound to the notch one locus. And we went ahead and added our NO donor, and essentially we saw that there's a reduction in binding there. And so that's just kind of schematically shown here. You know, in normal glycemia, there may be a little bit of JR2 here, but notch one is being expressed. Once you have hyperglycemic conditions, there's more JR2 that's present, and it's specifically present at the notch one locus, and that, that can be essentially reversed um, with um, addition of NO donors. And so we went back in vivo um, to our E13.5 hearts that were, um, these are now wild type hearts that were exposed to maternal hyperglycemia, and we saw a, a similar um, finding with chip PCR again pulling down with um, Jared 2 we again saw enrichment of Jared 2 at that locus with hyperglycemia. So that was um, really exciting to us because it kind of proposed a mechanism by which um, hyperglycemia was specifically interacting with the notch one signaling pathway to cause congenital heart disease. And so we collaborated with Zihan at DC Children's to see you know, is this pathway actually conserved in, in lower species? And so we went to the Drosophila model, and so he had already um, been working on a model of diabetes in the fly. And so basically you can feed them a regular diet and add some sucrose. Um, the 4X hand GAL4 system just allows you to express different genes within the cardiac um, precursors in the fly, and then we can look at the lethality and the phenotype of the progeny. And so the top two slides here are essentially just looking at the glucose levels in the flies. And so you can see in a non-diabetic, this is the normal glucose in a fly. When you gave the extra sucrose, they have higher glucose levels. And these are just the, um, the progeny. So once you look at the progeny flies, they have normal glucoses. Uh, Trelose is another sugar and a similar phenomenon that occurs there. So essentially what we want to do is, is this gene environment occurring interaction? Same thing, hyperglycemia, not certainly. Do we see the same thing in a fly model? Do we see this gene environment interaction? And so in a fly, I mentioned he has this um, a hand um, enhancer that can drive um, expression specifically in the, in the cardiac cells. And so we use three different ways to knock down um, notch one signaling, just like we did in the mouse, we use the notch one heterozygote mouse. Here he can overexpress JR2, which I mentioned that's going to reduce notch one. You can numb is a known um, inhibitor of notch one signaling, so if you overexpress that, you'll get decrease, and you can just use RNAi and, and knock it down in the fly. And so um, once what he essentially saw, um, we're initially first looking at um, lethality of the um, embryos in terms of if they're being born. So you don't really see anything in, with diabetes in the fly with just um, having a high elevated glucose. With JR2 overexpression, so again, you're just knocking down notch one, you see some lethality, but once you expose them to high glucose, you see an increased lethality. Again, this gene environment interaction where 
losing notch one and maternal diabetes, you increase embryonic lethality. And then he actually went further and actually looked at some of the adult survivors. And well, we haven't done this in the mouse model, but what he saw essentially was whenever you have um, embryos that have been exposed to uh, an elevated hyperglycemic environment, the, the, um, the adults that, that survive and are born, they actually have decreased survival. And so I'm going to go from here from the green to the purple here. And so you can see that they live shorter. If you go from the notch one RNAi, which is the blue to the kind of the reddish color here, they have a shorter lifespan. And then um, they numb over expression similarly. And same with the controls. He saw a significantly shorter lifespan. And the other thing he did was he went ahead and did a rescue experiment where he put Jared II back in. And while we didn't see any change in embryonic lethality, we saw an improvement in terms of their adult survival. So that instead of you know, having this shortened survival, they actually moved back up um, in terms of surviving at a more normal time. This would be coming from here to here. So this orange to red. Again, implying that this pathway is extremely important and Jared too is specifically required for that. So that's kind of where we are right now in terms of thinking about, you know, what is going on with maternal hyperglycemia, a maternal environment. It's clear that there's probably multiple mechanisms why we're seeing decreased NO, there's increased ROS, but there's probably also some changes epigenetically in terms of the NOS3 locus that leads to a combination of um, decreased NO. We've actually done some experiments where we've given um, N-acetylcysteine, which is a, 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 a scavenger, uh, and we can't actually completely rescue it, and that may be because of this epigenetic change that we're seeing in terms of NO production. Ultimately, when you get decreased NO, you get increased Jared 2 which then will um, bind with SETDB1 on the NOTCH1 locus to reduce NOTCH1 transcription. And then you see a decrease in this pathway, which is likely leading to these um, ventricular septal defects and disrupting heart development. So that's kind of where we are in terms of going back to some of the original slide. This is my revised version of that slide from 50 years ago. Clearly, chromosomal and single mutant genes are important. There's probably still interactions between environment and mo modifier genes, but there's likely numerous susceptibility genes that are interacting with environment that's causing disease. And ultimately, long-term goal is to translate these genetic and environmental and just better etiologic understandings to the care of kids with congenital heart disease, not only for improved diagnosis and genetic counseling, but also can you predict outcomes. These individuals, we are now proposing have mutations in genes that are important for heart development. A lot of these genes are expressed in the adult heart, and so it's not, it would not be surprising that you're going to have some cardiovascular outcomes in these adults who are now been able to survive. And then ultimately, the longer and harder path is disease mechanisms to potentially come up with ideas for prevention or treatment. So, so. I just want to thank everyone for their attention um, and thank um, the people who did this work. Stephanie LaHaye did all of the, the whole exome sequencing work, and then um, Mother Mita Basu did all of the gene environment interactions, and my collaborators, specifically Zi Han and Jun Zi Zhu, who's in his lab, who did some of the fly work. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, so th that's a good question. So the one question is, is insulin signaling affecting? It, you know, is, are the embryos hyperinsulinemic? We haven't measured that directly. Um, I will say this, that the, the pancreas is developing. I mean, the initial time when you even see PDX1 is like E9.5, E10.5. And so how hyperinsulinemic could you be? That's one question, even at that very early stage when you're you know, the heart is the first organ to form, so how much of an effect are we going to have? I think the other thing is we've done some stuff in, with chick embryos and exposed them to hyperglycemia, and we're able to show, show in, that, in that model system that we can get congenital heart defects. And also a lot of our stuff is being done in AVM cells. Though it's a cell culture system, I don't think we're going to have any 
the, the gene expression patterns we're seeing, there's no elevated insulin levels in, in those cells. So that's why we would argue, and people have always argued that hyperglycemia is a primary teratogen in maternal diabetes, but that is something that we cannot formally rule out. But that, that's our evidence to say that it's probably not what's causing it. Yeah. Really nice, exciting. So, mm. well, imagine the 2 this kind of protein is magic. Do you think uh, the, if you see up recognition of the 2 gene expression in heart failure or so heart failure so in general, so, or diabetic cardio valves? That I don't know. Uh, I don't know if any. I don't know. So that's really a very good question. Really good. Yeah, has, has, that, has that been, I don't know if that's been looked at in so terms of the. Is a kind of adapter protein or just the GLD2? Compare us for more GLD2 is a sub, it's a subsonic protein or it's kind of. It's a nuclear protein. It's a. Well, it, it has a DNA binding domain and it, it works, you know, in concert with some of these other epigenetic, you know, set db one and other methyltransferases, but it d hasn't been shown to have its own methyltransferase activity. So, so it does. It works with someone else, essentially. Is there kinase activity or no kinase activity? Just the transfer factor? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think so. I'm intrigued by your mouth, not by your mouth model. I wonder, I thought about it. You mentioned about different genetic background combination. We haven't tried that. That would be an interesting question if we put it into different strains, the notch one heterozygous. Especially you see them under a normal hyperglycemic mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Do you know the notch is expressed in the alpha beta cells? In the, in the pancreas? Yeah. I don't know. I don't think so, though. But it may be. I don't know. How am I still going to look that up? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. So, is there any um, non coding uh, matrix mutation that has been discovered in any Non coding? Yes. So, there's some work by um, Marcello Nobrega where he reported a non coding mutation in a human patient for TBX5. And that was a regular. So, there is. I mean, I, I leave that out, but there is, you know, but we don't, haven't. Comp fully understood like where are all the non-coding regions and where are the variants, but I'm sure there are. Yeah, I'm sure there are. There is going to be. Um, it's just, I would say the progress on that has been relatively slow, and I think even whole genome, you know, we're getting better and better at understanding whole exome data because of the um, exact database, which has 61,000 whole exomes. Well, that allows you to know if something's rare or truly rare. You need that level of whole genome <laughs> database for, in order to start looking at is this variant interesting enough to study to that point of, you know, creating, you know, gene editing and knocking it out and, and doing all that. Yeah. So, so, the, so the mutations we're looking at are germline mutations. Oh, I see. So they're, they're in every cell. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have one more question about the, the age correlation for Norch. Do you know there's any expression correlate with different stage development, particularly with aging? For the reason I ask that question is because if so, one day is in two months, all mice are worth is nine. It seems that I remember correctly. Yeah, months, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also you talk about this black box of genetic, epigenetic black yeah. box, we don't know what's regulating. There, th I mean, I think there, aging, aging could be playing a role from an epigenetic standpoint. I haven't looked at those later time points if there's a change in gene expression. So I don't know about oh, that. How long maximally those mice will survive? Um, the notch one heterozygous, they'll, I mean, we, we haven't aged them, but I would guarantee at least a year, a year and a half, yeah. Because it's very mild dilation. I wouldn't expect them there, that they're going to drop dead. I'd be surprised if they did that. 
So there will be um, lunch after this. And please note, if you're a student, um, you are invited to the lunch, even if you're not currently enrolled in, in this as a class. Um, if you attend seminar, we invite you to uh, go to the lunch, so please do that. Um, and thank you, to, as usual, to everyone for their attendance. Um, and please join me.